Well, so uh, for Faith Promise this morning, we, uh, we have the gift of being joined by several guests. To my left is, uh, is Brandy Schrader. Brandy is the executive director of Lima Samaritan House. Um, to her left, we have Nick Graham. Uh, Nick is the men's ministry director of the Lima Rescue Mission. And then here at the end, we have Randy Kimple. Randy is the executive director of Our Daily Bread. Um, each of our guests this morning are involved in ministries that serve those in need in the downtown Lima area. And this morning, as we focus on faith promise and the mission of God um, here locally and, and throughout the world, I've asked them to join us for a conversation about what caring for those in need looks like here in our community. So um, maybe it's just kind of an icebreaker to get us started. Could you begin by telling us a little a bit about the work that you guys do uh, in the people that you serve? We were in a different order earlier, and this is just throwing me off. I <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm, I'm with you. First, but, um, so I'm with Samaritan House, and we have been serving since 1987, um, serving women and women and their children, uh, those that are facing homelessness. And so what that looks like is a three-story, 38-room facility with 17 bedrooms and seven bathrooms. And when they would um, come in in need of service, you would have a case management team that meets with you at least twice weekly, um, meals, laundry facilities, yeah. your basics, your personals, things like that. Um, and then just trying to connect them um, with resources that are already available. We have a lot of great partners in the community um, doing good works and just trying to just identify any anything that kind of needs to be addressed when you live with people. Yes. Yeah. A lot more is revealed. <laughs> Brandy, say. can you tell us a little bit about the situations that maybe some of these women and families find themselves in prior to coming to Lima Samaritan House? Um, I mean, a lot of it could be just financial or a sickness that can take you to that. I mean, mental illness and um, addiction. I think we would all say that that's prevalent and something that we deal with. Um, but again, I always have to just go back to the. There was a lot that preceded that, yeah. and so a lot of times there's just a brokenness or you know. Um, abuse or there's just a lot of trauma sure. oftentimes in the past it's not something sometimes it is as simple as you know you had a job and as simple as you got ill and had no support just that yeah. simple yeah. and that you came in um but yeah a lot of times it's very complex there's yeah. a lot going on yeah thank you uh yeah nick tell us about the lima rescue mission uh, yeah so i'm i'm uh, i'm nick graham i've been working at the lima rescue mission for over 10 years now uh, but the mission's been around for a lot longer than that it's been here for about 117 years, uh, back in wow. 1906, wow. Um, and it is a gospel rescue mission. We're, we're, we're non nonprofit. We uh, we don't get any government funding, um, and what we do is we provide food, clothing, and shelter uh, for the homeless men of the community. Um, you know, it's, it's it's our it's our niche. It's what we've been doing for 117 years. We love it. Um, another thing that we do is we have a day camp that we do um, every summer. Uh, for the inner city and at-risk youth. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so, Nick, the Lima Rescue Mission has a really neat way of not just serving the homeless men in the community, but also developing relationships with and sharing the gospel, too. Can you tell us um, a little bit about the point system at the Lima Rescue Mission? Sure. At the, at the mission, uh, not only do we require men to come to uh, a devotion for supper as well as a chapel service in order to be able to stay, but we require them to come to different classes and Bible studies, including financial classes and uh, uh, you know, drug abuse classes and stuff like that um, in order to earn a certain number of points each month in order to stay for the following month. That number is 10. They got to earn 10 points in an entire month. Uh, so it's not real hard to do. Um, if they don't earn it, they don't get to stay the next month. So we, we try to make the responsibility go back on them. Yeah. And, that's, and that's kind of, you know, what we want to do is we want to make them be responsible for themselves. Um, and so they have to earn points and they can use those points not only to stay for the next month, they have to just earn them for that, uh, but they can spend those points on things like doing laundry for free, uh, we have a workout room, as well as free nights in the dorms. Normally it costs 50 cents a night to stay. Wow. Wow. Nick, thank you. Um, Randy, tell us about Our Daily Bread. Our Daily Bread's been around uh, 32 years now. Uh, I've been there eight. Uh, we're open Monday through Friday. We serve donuts and coffee from 9 to 9.30. Serve lunch from 11 to 11 to from 11:30 to 1, and then we have a dinner from 4:30 to 5:15. Uh, we put God first, so we we have a de devotional and blessing before the two meals. Um, we also have showers that are free to the public. We have free clo clothing and free household goods, small little mm -hmm. knickknacks, things like that too, uh, for people. 
Yeah. Randy, one of the things that I love about Our Daily Bread is that you guys take food very seriously. Can you tell us about the quality of these meals and why that matters to you? Well, Miss Sharon, our cook, if you've ever met her, you love her. Uh, like I said, within five minutes of meeting her, I knew she was the cook we needed. I uh, didn't even know she could cook, but she can cook. She I can mean, cook. She can cook. I gained uh, about 100 pounds since she started there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, her fried chicken is the best anywhere. Nothing leaves the kitchen. And she said this, and, and I agree with 100%. She won't put anything out that she wouldn't feed her family. Uh, so even people donate from, like uh, uh, we get from St. Rita's uh, leftovers. Somebody might donate after a graduation party. It's going to have her touch in it. It's not going to taste right. the same coming in as it did going out. <laughs> she's going she's gonna to put her touch on it. That's right, yeah. If you've had, if you've, if you've had a meal of Our Daily Bread, then you know that Miss Sharon is cooking up the kind, of, the kind of meal that'll make you taste and see that the Lord is good. <laughs> can, you, um, can each of you... Share a story about how you've seen transformation in the lives of those that you serve. What is kind of the story that captures the significance of the work that your ministry is doing? Well, shortly after I started there, I kind of realized that we're not there just for the people that come to eat. Mm -hmm. We're also there for the volunteers. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, before dinner was served, I, they were still working in the kitchen. I was sitting behind the serving line, and a gentleman come over. He said, thank you for letting me and my son come up here. Uh, he's 87 years old. About a year ago, his, his wife passed away. They'd been married 65 years. And his son's friend had been up there and told him that they could bring the stuff up to our daily bread, that, her clothes and things like that. So they started doing that. And they met Miss Sharon. And I uh, asked her if we needed anything, and they, she said, well, I need mayonnaise. So, you know, next day they come in with a case of mayonnaise. And then they started working with Ms. Sharon. Uh, the, the son, he's got a chopper of vegetables. We get a lot of ch vegetables. So first he was taking them home, chopping them, and bringing them back. And then uh, he goes in the back, and the, and the father, he works over with Ms. Sharon. He's right on her elbow, and it's, it's, just, it's just great to watch. Uh, but, but he, he, you know, he thanked me for letting him come up. I said, well, you guys do a lot of work for him. Thank you for coming. And we talked about, you know, 65 years. He lost more than just a wife. He lost, man, so much more. A uh, companion, just something that was always there. And he's, he's legally blind. He can't see much beyond outstretched arms. So he was really dependent on his wife, too, before she passed. Uh, and, and that's why he likes working in the kitchen, because it's all right here. And Miss Sharon loves him because she says, stir the gravy, and he stands there and stirs the gravy. He didn't just swipe it a couple times and walk away. Uh, so after our conversation with him, I, I went to the back, get something to drink, and, and his son was back there, and I told him about our conversation. And, and the son says, you know, honestly, he says, I, I, I think it saved his life by bringing him up here. Hmm. Um, you know, the, the, the father said, if I could drive, I'd be up here three days a week. <laughs> so he, he's depending on the son to bring him up. But that purpose that he has now, coming up and just doing something, yeah. has, has, like you say, probably extended his life. Yeah, it's amazing to see how God meets us where we are in any circumstance, in any season of our lives, and uses us and calls us to serve and calls us to bless. Thank you, Randy. Um, Nick, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's so easy to get focused on uh, the, the difficult stories, the hard stories, the the not so uplifting stories, because those are the ones that kind of stick in your mind. Um, and but many of the stories that that you want to share are the share are the, are the stories that you just you don't know because they the people have come in, they've they've used the facility, um, they've did what they're supposed to do, and they get out and you never see them again. Um, you know, we we still pray for them, we still want them to to do the best, but we and we and we hope that what we've imparted upon them uh, sticks with them for the rest of their life. Uh, but there's one story in particular of a, of a guy, I'm not going to say any names, but uh, he, before he came to the mission, he would get drunk every single night. Um, and one night he came home and got drunk and then set his porch on fire and he wasn't able to stay at his house anymore. He had no electricity, racked up a $10,000 electric bill um, using, I think, I think he was part of the PIP program and that kind of stuff. Uh, but he came to the mission, um, didn't know the Lord, um, but he found Jesus. 
uh, he, he, he met Jesus there. We, we were able to share the gospel with him. He came to know the Lord, and his life just transformed completely. Um, you know, no, no, no more alcohol for him, which was, which was pretty awesome. But he also uh, was one of the few who utilized the financial class that we, that we do. Uh, and he was able to pay off that $10,000 electric bill. He was able to save money. Um, but he was also able to actually become part of the staff at the Lima Rescue Mission. Um, it's, I mean, it, it's absolutely, uh, it's absolutely fantastic story. Um, and when, when he left the mission, um, when, when he, he, when he said, you know, he's getting old, his time was done. Uh, he, he was continuing to do ministry. He was doing, uh, I think it was called, uh, behind, behind the walls, um, prison ministry and that kind of stuff. And, um, he comes back every once in a while and I, and I help him do his taxes. Uh, but I mean, that story just sort of, just sort of resonates with yeah. me and sticks with me. Yeah, it's amazing to see how God not just transforms our spiritual lives, but he transforms our financial lives, our family lives, all of these, all of, all of the facets of our lives. Uh, when we hear the call of God, he transforms, and it's just, it's amazing. Brandy? I think both of those speak to, to the, um, the need for us to find our purpose and to have purpose and that life feels really empty without that purpose. So I think for like, it's, it's not that everyone that um, comes to the shelter it doesn't have a faith. A lot of people have a very strong faith. I've seen mm -hmm. really beautiful, we have a, a back porch where they'll smoke on sometimes and it's a brick building and they'll, there'll be chalk out there yeah. and they'll be writing messages of encouragement to each other. Wow. Like I say, maybe every 50th, it's a cuss word. You know, we have to find <laughs> race, but not always beautiful. But just, just to see people in their lowest times to be still encouraging yeah. or to give their last cigarette or a bus fare, you know, just something so simple. Yeah. Like it's, it's not um, always that they haven't encountered it. They just need loved on and they yeah. need help lifting back up. And um, so I, this, the story that I would share is the same. I probably start, shared with the first service would just be um, a, a young lady that we've encountered multiple times. Uh, I've been there since 98. She was with us, you know, sometime around that time as a child, maybe a few years before as a five-year-old at Christmas, um, had had a rough life up to that point. And uh, when we encountered her again, she was a young adult and she needed the services again, had you know, moved out, moved around, come back, and just said that she was struggling with addiction, but what was keeping her going was the peace that she found as a child in that shelter, that she encountered love yeah. and hope and, a, and the feeling of home and being safe. And that was, she just was, she wanted it again. Um, and, and so a couple years ago, she did a fundraiser for us and said, you know, she still struggles. And then um, just recently, there was someone posing as us on social media somewhere, and she was quick to be our yeah. defender and, and to kind of straighten that out. But um, again, it doesn't always look the way that on paper, you know, that the success story would be, here's their, the, the house and the car and everything's perfect because that rarely happens in 90 days. Yeah. You know, it's not that kind of turnaround. I think it's the, the bigger part is the heart change that happens yeah. or remembering that you're loved and that you're valued and yeah. that you have meaning and that you have something to give. Yeah, and I think it's a miracle to see the things that maybe seem small for us are seeds that are planted that come to fruition over the journey of a lifetime. It's just, it's amazing. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me about the work that you all are invested in is that each of you are in the hospitality business, right? You're preparing food or providing lodging for your guests, but most notably, your guests can't really pay for your services and they find themselves on the margins of society, right? The, the impoverished, the homeless, those without stable family. Why do you think it's important that the people of God, the church, is committed to ministry to the poor and the marginalized in our community? I mean, it's our job as the church, right? It's, uh, you know, Jesus said, you know, to feed my sheep. Jesus said to take care, take care of my sheep. We are the hands uh, and the feet, and, you know, we, we will be known by our love. Uh, and, you know, what, what better way to love people than to lift them up? To, to encourage them, to, to help them, to, to meet their felt needs, uh, but also to meet their spiritual needs as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It, it, it's, it, it, you know, God put us in a community, and he brings us all together. If, if we weren't here to help each other, then we would just be spread out all over the place. Mm -hmm. and, and as corny as it sounds, you can't spell community without unity. Yeah. And that means everybody, you know, that, that means helping the least 
and you know if we have to the most whatever we, we're here together for that purpose um, you know we accept everybody at our daily bread but it's not everybody that comes to us it's just those you know mostly with low or no income and you know like you said we try to not just feed them uh, physical food but we that's yeah. you know we talk about God each and every day yeah. and and you know, we try to stress hope and purpose each and every day. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I mean, Randy, you mentioned, you mentioned helping the least of these. And I think often when we think about care for the needy, we go to this passage in Matthew 25. And it, Jesus says, Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. As each of you are invested in caring for the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, I'm curious, do you think about this passage often? And what does it mean to see Christ in the poor and the needy? It, part of that's on our wall, so... Uh, and it's about 12 inch letters on our wall too. But it's, it's funny how uh, sometimes a volunteer will be, well, you know, this is like that verse, Matthew 25. And it's like, yeah, it's on the wall right above <laughs> there. <laughs> so it doesn't, it doesn't go without us noticing any day, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I would just say, you know, if you ask what it means to see the Christ and to see Christ with the poor and the needy, I mean, he, it's where he is. like. If we're suffering, he's with us. If we're without, he's, he's always wow, with yeah. us. Um, biblically, if you go through, I mean, he's with people that were in need. You know, yeah. at all times, he's not hanging out with people that seem to have everything together all the time. I mean, those are the stories that stick with us. So yeah. where, you, where you meet people in those circumstances, you will find him also. Yeah. And I think that speaks back to, to what the guys shared, um, is that this blessing goes two ways. And Wes will share something with, wonderful with you at the end that kind of ties that to back, back to that as well. But it's something by the way that we're designed. Yeah. You know, we're designed um, to desire him, and he continually pursues us, but it's our choice, you know, to, to be there. And so I think each of us would say our jobs might seem pretty lowly and, you know, humble and a little rough sometimes, <laughs> but I, I think we would all say that we feel very blessed to be there. Yeah. Um, we feel very blessed to be getting to be in those low places. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Uh, I mean, so the Bible says, and I'm sure you guys all know this verse, is in, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And um, skipping ahead a few verses, it said, let us make man in our image. Um, we are each in the image of God. Each of us are image bearers of God. And we see Christ in them because Christ is in them. They're, they are image bearers of him, and we need to make sure that we're taking care of them. Just, just as we're taking care of ourselves, we need to make sure that we're lifting up uh, those, who are, those who are less and marginalized and, and in poverty. Yeah, yeah, Nick, that's, that's powerful, powerful imagery. Um, lastly, for, for those of us who might be feeling the prompting of the Spirit um, to join in the work that you are doing, how can we get involved? How can we serve? What, what are the kinds of needs that, that you might have in your ministries? I mean, first and foremost, pray. Uh, I mean, that's that's the. I mean, that's the prime. One of the primary purposes of of the body of Christ is prayer. Um, and so, you know, I'm sure I speak for all of us, but we we really we really do covet your prayers. Um, but in a more practical way, uh, at the mission, um, we serve supper 365 days a year. Uh, we serve breakfast too, but we serve supper uh, and. Uh, we sometimes have uh, individuals or families or groups come in and serve, and that would be a really practical way uh, just, to, just to come in and take some time out of your day and serve. Um, you can bring a meal or we can make the meal and you can serve it, um, but it's, it's huge for us because uh, sometimes, you know, through the stresses of the day, through the stresses of just the job, uh, you know, our, our, 
our patience wears thins and it, and it stretches us out. Um, and, and one other way um, would be the seven o'clock service. If you wanna, if you wanna come and share the gospel, if you feel that calling to to, to plant that seed into people's hearts, um, there are open slots for for people to come in and they preach the message at, at the seven p.m. service. And we'd love to have you. Thank you. I I agree. Prayer number one. Uh, you know. There's a lot of stories I could tell, success stories, and I hold on to each one. That's what gets me up in the morning and gets me in there. But not every day is that day because uh, we deal a lot with uh, mental illness, drug addiction, and just people who have lost hope. And that's the hardest thing, somebody that's lost hope. Uh, so prayer for the staff, prayer for the uh, patrons. Uh, if you want to come in and help serve a dinner, uh, one or two people can show up any day. We've always got room for that. Any more than that. Please contact us, and we can set up a date. We're, we're online, odbread.org, uh, and we're on Facebook. You can contact us. Uh, we can always use a handyman. Somebody come in once or every week or two weeks or something, and, you know, with a drill and a few things, and, and uh, uh, we've always got something that needs fixed. Uh, uh, stocking the shelves in the back, dating the cans as far as the expiration date, and putting so we can rotate our stock, put the new ones in the back, pulling the old ones to the front so we can rotate our stock. There's just, there's a lot to do there. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if you want to help Miss Sharon in the kitchen uh, for lunch, that's our big meal. Uh, come in around 9, and she'll definitely put you to work. <laughs> Thanks, Randy. There, are, there is definitely a theme among nonprofit partners. I believe that we need hands and feet, um, yeah. but I would 100% agree about the prayer first and foremost on, on all the levels too, because the last thing you want is for someone to reach out and want to do something that doesn't want to be there. Yeah. Um, so I would always say, if you feel stirred or you feel called to, to engage in a way, I mean, people have, you always have something to offer. You have prayer, you have smiles, you have a, a simple act. I mean, if we receive, as, as we've all mentioned, encouragement for ourselves is really important as well. Yeah. So um, I know in my office, I have letters from my prisoner friend. Um, he sends $10. That's probably a lot. I'm guessing I've never been to prison, but it sounds like a lot of money to send from prison. So, um, but you know, he's been saved there. And, yeah. and so he reaches out. And, and so I have letters from um, pastors and previous residents and just, you know, anything that we need around us to surround us, to remind yeah. us of our purpose, to stay encouraged. It's been a lot of years. And I won't say that that hasn't been hard sometimes to stick sure. through that, but we could never do that without everyone on all those levels. So again, praying into our teams. Um, if you want to come in, you know, walk through and, and do a prayer, engage, or um, maybe you feel like you need to come to the facility first to know you're feeling stirred or feeling called, but you're not yeah. sure your place. Yeah. You can just call, we can set that up. But Always, I mean, we always, we all have wish list and we always, you know, need funding, but funding doesn't mean anything if you don't have people to help. I yeah. mean, it, it won't fix anything. Yeah. It just won't, you need people. And I think during COVID, we would see that a lot. There seemed to be money floating everywhere, but somehow we've all experienced that it seems like more people are held or more people are yeah. in this, this heavy state, you yeah. know? And so again, prayers, prayers that they would be released, prayers that they would be lifted. And really, we can't do any of our work if we don't have open hearts. And so mm -hmm. just kind of praying for those that we serve um, to have open hearts. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Um, as we wrap up our conversation here, I want to add that um, starting next week, we're going to be taking a collection for items that will be benefiting your ministries. And we'll be collecting these items for the next several weeks through the duration of Lent. Um, so maybe kind of for our final lightning round here, what is one item that would be most helpful for us to donate to your ministry? Toilet bowl cleaner. Toilet bowl cleaner. Socks. She looked at me because she knew I was going to laugh. <laughs> For us, it's sugar. Toilet bowl cleaner, socks, and sugar in that order. Very good. <clears throat> um, well, thank you all so much for being with us this morning. And thank you for the important work um, that you're just faithfully doing in our community in the name of Christ. Um, can we show our, our guests a little appreciation? Each of the organizations that have been represented by our guests this morning are faith promise partners. They're all faith promise partners. And that means that they have received financial support from your giving to faith promise.
In fact, they are just three of the nearly 40 ministries and missionaries that we are able to support because we have committed to prioritize giving to those that have given their lives to doing the compassionate work of God in the world. And I think it's important to hear these stories because these stories remind us that God is using our commitment to generosity to transform lives. This morning, I'm encouraged by this reminder. God is not far off. God is not distant. God has not left us to our own devices. How do I know that God is not far off? In the book of Luke, Jesus makes his first public address in the synagogue, quoting the words of Isaiah. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I know that God is not far off because at Lima Rescue Mission, good news is being brought to the poor. I know that God is not far off because the oppressed are going free at Lima Samaritan House. I know that God is not far off because the year of the Lord's favor is being proclaimed at our daily bread. As we celebrate faith promise this morning and we focus on God's mission in the world, we're reminded that the same spirit that was hovering over the waters of creation is calling us today to participate in the work of his new creation. God is still at work in the world and he's calling his people, he's calling you and me to join him in that work. In hearing these stories and testimonies this morning, I'm reminded that in Scripture, we learn that caring for the poor, the sick, the imprisoned, the orphan, the widow, is not just a noble activity that we are encouraged to participate in. The Scriptures reveal that care to the marginalized is actually a part of our worship. That something critical to our salvation is bound up in the care for those on the edges of society. As we continue in Lent, and many of us are in the midst of fasting, this is what the Lord speaks to us through his prophet Isaiah. God says, is not this the fast that I choose? to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover them and not hide yourself from your own kin, then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help and he will say, here I am. As we think about fasting in this season, might we dwell on how God is calling us to look outward, how God is calling us beyond ourselves to care for the vulnerable and the forgotten. The people of God have been tasked with the mission of God to bless the world. That is, we have been called to be the movement of God's love in the world, to be a reflection of the love of the Father. Jesus says, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Next week, we'll be making our pledges to faith promise. And this pledging is separate. It's different from our regular tithes and offerings. Our pledges are a commitment. They're a promise. We'll pledge to give a particular amount. And for most of us, we'll pledge before we even have that money to give or even knowing maybe where that money will come from. This is why we make this promise in faith. As we journey through this season of Lent, we're reminded of Jesus in the wilderness and Israel before him. We're reminded of the manna that God daily provided to the Israelites. As we journey with God through the wilderness, we trust that he will provide for his people that he has never failed to sustain us. And this is the miracle of the economy of God, right? 
that as we look into the wilderness, we so often see scarcity. We fear that the resources might be running thin, that there might not be enough, that we might have to hoard and gather and collect. But not only is God faithful to give us the things that we need, he gives us enough to bless and care for others. His desire is that we might trust him enough to be a people who share to become a people who are generous and bless others because we have been a people who have been blessed. Because God has not just given us enough, he's filled our cups to overflowing. My hope is that in this coming week, we'll be in prayer about how God is calling us to step out in faith, how he, how he is leading us to generosity as we pledge to support the missional work that's been done through our Faith Promise partners, partners like Samaritan House, like Our Daily Bread and the Lima Rescue Mission? Would we also be in prayer about how God is calling us not just, is calling us to give not just our resources, but also our time, our service, how God might be calling us to provide care and hospitality to those in need in our community? Might we have the courage to find Christ in the hungry, to find Christ in the hurting, to find Christ in the forgotten. Would you stand with me this morning and join us for our benediction? God, we thank you that you have brought us here into the wilderness of Lent. In the wilderness, would you teach us what it is to be poor in spirit? And in our poverty, would you reveal to us your kingdom? In this season, would you make us hunger and thirst for righteousness? For we trust that you will feed us with your word. If we're honest with ourselves, we are so often filled with fear and an inability to feel an inability to be moved, to be brokenhearted? Would you fill us with compassion for those who suffer around us? Would you fill us with the courage to care for those that you care for? Would you fill us with the joy of your salvation? Would you fill us with the energy that comes from knowing that you have called us to do good work? Would you be breathing your spirit into us? Would you be making us alive by your word? Make us more like you, we pray. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. You may go in peace this morning.